Hello, hello. Are we live? Looks like I'm live. All right. Welcome back to my font parsing and rendering project. Uh, we've made some pretty good progress with font parsing, uh, and we're thoroughly into font rendering. So I've updated the title of the stream. Uh, so I've done a little bit of work off stream since the last time. I think it's finally time for some automated testing. I don't know whether you want to call this unit testing or integration testing, uh, but that's what I'm planning to work on tonight. So we have a PPM image reader. Well, we have a PPM image writer, and then off stream I made a reader. So what we could do is we could do a round trip test of writing a PPM file and then reading that PPM file back into memory and checking if the contents are the same as what we started with. Uh, I've also improved my, my PPM viewing workflow uh, so I can open a file in GIMP to view it. And then I found that they have this revert option which will reload a file from memory. Uh, so you can click that, uh, and you can also change your preferences to add keyboard shortcuts in GIMP. So I went ahead and changed the file revert shortcut. Yeah, so I went and added Control R there. So now I can just hit Control R after I switch to that window, and that will reload a file. So I can demonstrate that. Uh, for example, if I change the background or change the foreground color in this image, uh, actually that's not really going to be very easy to see. So, so I'm going to change the background instead of the foreground. Instead of this background, uh, we can go to a, a darker background and then rerun. And then if I revert the image in GIMP, you're going to see, I think it's I think it's this upper background, not the lower blue background, but control R, enter, boom, there's a different image. And then I can go back, I can revert that color, run it again. And we're quickly back to the the original background. So that's a lot easier than, uh, I forget how I was opening PPM files yesterday. I, I guess I was using GIMP, but I was continuously like dragging and dropping the file into GIMP to reopen it. So this is a little bit faster than the workflow from the last stream, and it's much, much faster than the the pre-PPM workflow where I was visualizing things in Scilab and doing a lot more copying and pasting and a lot of manual work with the mouse, which I hate to use in my Vim and Tmux centric workflow. So this, this is better in my opinion. Uh, so it's time for some unit testing. Uh, we have this image writer and then off stream, I also made an image reader so the writer, you give it the canvas and a file name, and it writes a file. And then the reader, it does the opposite of that. You give it a file, and then it reads that file and returns a canvas. Uh, so then I can compare those canvases and see if all of the pixels in both canvases are the same, using this handy function called all that's built into Fortran. Uh, all takes a logical array and tells you if everything is true. So that's what this checks. So I would like to take this out of main and make a unit test for that. Uh, but yeah, so I don't want to test in main. I don't even want to test in my Kali program, not in that executable. I would like to do my testing uh, in a separate executable. So for that, I'm going to make uh, a, new, a new program in a new source file. So let's edit that. Let's call it test.f90. Uh, so in C, you always have to have a function named main. 
but because Fortran has these separate notions of subroutines and functions and a program, you can actually name your main program whatever you want. Like I could name this test and then the start and the end have to match. So I could do that, but I, I just like to name everything main anyway for consistency. Uh, it makes things simpler. Uh, but I'm gonna give, going to create a module in here. Uh, I guess I'll call that test M for test module. And that's going to contain some functions. We'll fill in the details later. Get my long equal sign separators in there. Uh, and at the beginning, it's just going to say hello from test main. Uh, so this is this is our source file. It's essentially a hello world program. Uh, now we need to get this into the build script via cmake. So I might as well edit that from here. Uh, I believe we have add executable. So yeah, sorry, this window is a little bit cramped, but I'm not going to do too much work in cmake here. Uh, so our cmix script, it separately builds a library and then it builds an executable which links to that library. Uh, but it builds one executable. Now I want to build a second executable so I'm basically going to copy this stuff and paste it. But instead of building exe, uh, well, let's give the new exe a different name. Uh, it has to have a different identifier in CMake. Uh, you, you don't need to use variables for these things in CMake. You can just say uh, add executable test.exe like it doesn't need to be. Uh, it doesn't need to be a variable like this, but I, I like to keep things abstract in case I want to go back and rename the executable that way. Uh, it's, it's easier in CMake like that. Uh, I'm just going to call this test and then there's no separate bin. So the exe bin is this weird workaround where in CMake if, if your library has the same name, for example, Kali as, as an executable, uh, CMake doesn't like that. And then what you have to do is you have to build it under one name and then use set target properties to change the name away from the default. Uh, but since our exe is named test, this is a little bit simpler in CMake. I think I don't need exe bin at all for this thing. I can just call it test exe. And then I don't need to do set target properties to rename it. Uh, so the source file for this is going to be test. And then it links to the same link libraries that the main executable links to. And that is just the Kali library. So we set the source files. Uh, we, have, we have to refer to those source files. Uh, this is going to have to be test source, not exe source. And I think that's it. That should build the test executable. So let's build using the build script, which just runs CMake. Uh, so it built the library. It built the main executable. It built the test source file. It built a test executable. Uh, so I think that's it if we look in the build directory. Yeah, now we have the usual main program, we have the library, and we also have this test program, so we could run that and it should say that hello world message that we just typed out. So build test, there it is. Uh, that's, that's all the C make work that we had to do. Uh, so I think I also want a testing script. We had, We, we had a Windows only test script that I haven't really used in a while called testwin.sh. 
Uh, and this only works on Windows in WSL because what it does is it hard codes the Windows fonts system directory and then it parses every font in that directory. Uh, I haven't really used this script in a while because I have hard coded glyph indices and I don't know if those glyph indices are the same across every font file. In fact, they're probably not the same. Uh, so if we go back to my main program, uh, yeah, this one. So I'm, I'm hard coding these glyph indices, like this says Kali in Greek letters, or I've said various things with like English letters, but in either case, the glyph indices are hard coding because that's what I'm passing to the glyph drawer. It passes, uh, well, well, it indexes the glyphs array using those glyph indices. Uh, but if you use a different font that has different meanings of these indices, then you're not going to be typesetting the same text. Uh, so it's not really useful for me to test 300 system font files with this. Uh, so I haven't run that test script in a while. Uh, so I, I want a new testing script, and I want it to be cross-platform. I want it to run on Windows and Linux and Mac OS. Uh, so it's not going to be this Windows testing script. But we can use this as a basis because I still want to uh, build before I run the tests. So those first few lines are going to be the same. So let's call that test.sh. It's no longer test win, it's just test. Nope, uh, not that. Abort. Nope. Here we go. Yeah, so this is cross platform now, or at least it should be. Uh, we'll do WSL to start, and then we'll figure out how well it works on other platforms. Uh, I think I'm not going to be looping for everything. Uh, maybe I'll put something like this back in later. But for now it's just going to build, and then it's going to, if, if we take a look at my run script, the run script builds, and then it runs the main executable. Uh, this I don't want it to run the main executable, I want it to run the new test executable. So that is build slash test instead of build slash Kali, like this run script. So I think that should do it. Uh, and it's still just going to print that hello world message from earlier. We can run this. There it is, hello from test main. Uh, now we can fill in that boilerplate with some actual testing. Uh, the first thing I want to test is this image write, read, round trip. So, uh, I, I also want to see if I can fail the test or not. And I, I, I might want to make a commit before I get everything totally implemented. Where are those things defined? Those are defined in Kali. So first of all, I want to use the Kali module because we're going to be testing functions from the library. So the testing module uses the Kali module. Uh, we have implicit none. Hopefully that shouldn't break anything yet. All right. Uh, and then I want to return an exit code. So call exit exit success by default. Uh, and if we check, well that didn't work. It's, oh, yeah, so this has to use testing module. Yeah, uh, the testing module uses the Kali module, so I think I can just do it like that. Although I think I did the opposite thing in the main main program. Yeah, so this one this one uses the Kali module directly. Uh, I guess I'm being a little bit inconsistent there, but yeah, so this is exit success. And then we can check that status code by doing echo dollar question. Dollar question is the the status of the last command, so that should be zero since it's success. It's at zero. Uh, and then if we change that to something else, 
Uh, it's just going to do the first one here. Exit failure. And then this should be like negative one or something non zero. Or maybe it's like 255. Now, if we check that code, yeah, it's negative one, but it underflows to 255. But as, as long as it's not zero, uh, that's, that's the information that I want to get out. So I think maybe I want to commit this before I fully implement a test just to just to see if I can catch the exit failure and, and then do that in a GitHub workflow. Uh, so I think Doesn't run on Windows because GitHub Actions is buggy with Fortran executables. But I want to run and then I want to test as well. Uh, at some point, maybe I'll only test and I won't run because the testing should cover the same things that the run does. Uh, but it doesn't hurt to have both. So let's add that to the workflow. And I think that should be it. Add that thing. There might be other stuff. Let's see. Test.sh. Uh, this is secret. Not ready to tell you about that yet. It's for maybe this weekend if, if I stream again this weekend. Mm. I was like, why did I delete this? But it was commented. I kind of missed that. That looks good. I added some more specific error messages because we have magic numbers in the TTF file, uh, but the PPM file also has a magic number. So if I, if I just say error bad magic number, uh, it's not necessarily clear which file type failed to read. So this is the image reader, which I did off screen. And actually, one of the first things I want to do after I get the testing up and running is to refactor the reader. I think that looks good. Uh, one last status check because I'm paranoid. Now this should fail in the GitHub workflows because we hard-coded this exit failure. Right, this thing says exit failure. The first one actually exits and then it never actually gets to this line. So this should fail the GitHub action. And then we can get rid of this line and it, it should pass. So let's see what that does. It already failed. That's good. That's what I wanted. If you can't break your tests, then you can't be sure that your tests are actually testing anything, because if they always pass, then that's not giving you any information. Uh, actually, this failed for a different reason. Yeah, so we have to call int. So I've, I've seen this error message before. I, I just have to call int. Uh, that did not do what I wanted it to do to that window. All right. So where is it? I think it's in Cali. Yeah, yeah I already have that line there. Uh, so that should be it. Not that. Oh, what's this going to do? Okay, yeah, that's good. See, that's why I don't use the script anymore because it, when it tries every font, uh, some of those glyphs turn out to be compound glyphs, and I can't handle those yet. So let's do the regular testing script, uh, and let's, let's run too. Yeah, so that, that is still good locally.
No, it should still fail, but it should actually compile this time. Hopefully it failed for the right reason this time. Uh, nope. I think I can just cast this down to int 4. It was... So I hope I put those parentheses in the right places. I think that's okay. Let's test it locally uh, by running run, not test. Okay, so those that round trip test is still all the same. for the third time. Hopefully this fails for the right reasons. Uh, <laughs> what the hell did I just do? Did I write this? Oh, I forgot this one. line 877. Yeah, that was it. This is what sucks about getting things working on three different platforms at the same time. Uh, the problem is that the GitHub CI even though we're both on Ubuntu, like I'm doing Ubuntu locally in WSL, and then the GitHub workflow is also running Ubuntu, uh, they have different versions of the G4Terrain compiler, uh, and their G4Terrain compiler is a little bit stricter about casting than mine is. So the only way for me to debug that is to push it and then see if it works in CI. Like I can't debug it locally because I don't have that version of G4Terrain. Uh, Guess what I should do is install that version of G4Tran. Uh, did I push that? No, I didn't push it. Yeah, but I, I actually get better coverage this way because now I'm testing three different platforms on GitHub and then I'm testing a fourth version of the compiler locally. So I get better coverage this way, even though it's kind of a pain. For the fourth time, hopefully this fails for the right reasons. Uh, I think, I think it did. I saw some green text. Yeah, so that part ran, and then, uh, not that. <laughs> I have to ch mod somewhere. Oh. I, I learned something new about git, where you can add, add the executability, and push that on git. I think I, I think I might have covered that in my first video here in this series. Buffer. There we go. Yeah, so this is not doing ch mode on anything. It just runs these shell scripts. But I did something special to commit it like that. And I can't remember what it was. Uh... Like locally, both of these scripts are executable, but I just haven't pushed that. Yep. 
Okay, I think this was it. Uh, our file is not named foo. It's, well, yeah. You don't want to enter that. It's test.sh. Does that show anything? Yep, it's modified. All we did was change the mode of the file. Spell executability, right? If that's even a word. I think we're getting close. If not this time, I think we'll get in the next commit or two. There we go. So it finally says hello, and then it fails because we're exiting with a failure code. Uh, so now we can fix that. Comment that out. This should do the success status and the workflow should finally pass. I hope. Ubuntu should be faster than the other two operating systems, so we'll probably get that before Mac or Windows do anything. There we go. So I'm confident that the other two should work. Actually, no. Something funny always happens on Mac OS. Mac OS is still installing GCC. Windows is done. Windows doesn't actually run the test, uh, but it does check if it compiles at least. I can do Windows locally. Uh, let me show you that. So this is a native Windows terminal, not WSL. Can I zoom in? There, there we go. So I hope that's readable. Uh, don't know if my build script will actually work. Whoa, that's not my keyboard layout. There we go. Don't think this works. No, it launched like a separate shell script. Uh, maybe if I do it from git bash, well, yeah, launched git bash. Yeah, and now that I did this outside of WSL, I have an actual Kali.exe file. You know, in, in WSL, we just get Kali without the .exe extension. Uh, so this is a native Windows executable, and this should actually run if I give it the right arguments. Uh, and you have to use backslashes because that's what Windows expects. Which I think it would probably work with forward slashes. Uh, wow, that takes forever. I don't know what this is doing. Maybe it doesn't work. Okay, it did. It just took forever. Yeah, so this thing does work on Windows. It is slow as hell, though. So that finally finished. Uh, then if I go to GIMP like this, it should be exactly the same. It shouldn't have changed. So yeah, that seems OK. So, so these things do run on Windows. It's just GitHub Actions has a bug where they refuse to run G Fortran compiled executables. Uh, even though I can do it, I don't know why GitHub workflows can't do it.
Uh, and now my build is going to be all messed up because I built it on out of WSL. If I go back to WSL, yeah, it thinks like I'm using a different compiler that's not cached, so then I have to clean and rebuild. Now I clean, so you can't see the Kali.exe, but now I just have Kali without the exe. So this is the WSL executable, uh, and it's, it's way faster. Like that was basically instantaneous. Uh, I don't remember, I don't think I timed it, because uh, Windows doesn't have this wonderful time command that tells you how long things take to run, but that took way longer than half a second. Maybe, maybe the maybe the Windows kernel was just getting warmed up. Uh, who knows? But yeah, this is compiled. Uh, Mac apparently did something. Yep, saying hello from test main. So the tests are running on at least two operating systems now. Now we have to add some actual tests instead of just this test stub. So I think the first thing I want to do is read and write, or write and then read a, an extremely simple image file. In fact, I might do like the example from the PPM Wikipedia page. Uh, I had this open the last stream or two, but it's, it's like a six pixel example with red, green, blue, and I hope black and white. If they don't have black and white, I might add black and white instead. Yes, I, I think I want to do this test image. I think six pixels is good. I, I might want to do more pixels, but I, I don't want to make it three by three, because if there's a bug that gets like the height and the width maxed up, that mixed up, then you want, to, you want to be able to catch that with a three by three image. Uh, so I like three by three, and then maybe we'll do a more complicated example as a second test. Uh, but I'm going to do this for the first one. So it's red, green, blue, yellow, white, and black. Uh, we're going to do it in binary. That's P6 instead of P3, because that's the, the format that I've implemented. Uh, yeah, let's make a function to do that. Uh, actually, I want it to be a subroutine. So let's call it test PPM1, and then we might have like a test PPM2 for a more complicated test. Uh, I also want to keep track of the number of successful tests and the number of failed tests. So we're going to have two arguments, n pass and n fail. Uh, and all of the testing subroutines are going to be like that. Uh, if, if you've looked at my Sintran series, uh, those testing subroutines are the same way. Uh, and then everything else will be local variables within one of these subroutines. Uh, so there will be no other arguments besides pass and fail. Uh, and the program, this program is going to own them. So we're going to declare those here. I think I want this to be implicit none too, because it's not actually inside the module. Uh, so initialize those to zero. And then at the end, if there are any failures, uh, could check, check if it's greater than zero, but I'm just gonna check if it's not zero because if somehow something subtracts something from end fail, uh, I, I guess you might wanna catch that. Actually, let's do it this way. Success first and then fail, else fail. And then we're going to call these testing routines. So I need to set up my canvas. I don't know where I want to read and write this file to. I, I want it to be in a directory that doesn't clutter my git history. 
So I guess I'll just have like an empty directory somewhere where the directory itself is tracked in Git, but then I don't track any of the contents. Uh, but we're going to have the canvas, so I want to double check this type, I think it's int4. Yeah, these are int4. Then I'll have a file name too. Where do I want to put this? Come on. Do I want to make a subdirectory out of source? I mean, what if I just put it in the build directory? Because that's already get ignored. Yeah, why not? Let's put it in the build directory. Let's go with kebab case. I like kebab case when I can use it. Uh, you can't use it for subroutine names, so this has to be, what is this, lower snake case. But for here, uh, let's go with camel case. Uh, so we're going to set this canvas. I guess I'm not even going to bother uh, making variables for the width and the height. It's just going to be 3 by 2. And then we're going to have red, green, and blue for the first row. jump back and check how I do new color. Do I even use it here? I use it in main. So that's white. We're, we're going to have to reuse white anyway. I want this to be two, two. So I want I, I want to do this exact same image, uh, not magnified. It's just going to be literally three by two pixels. Uh, so I want this one, which is two comma two, to be white. There we go. And then I want red, green, blue. Uh, these are, I guess if Indianness matters, these are like, is this big Indian? Basically, these are the red bits. This is green, this is blue. And then the last one, which is always FF, is alpha. Uh, alpha doesn't actually get saved to PPM files. Uh, but I, I have that in my color type anyways, because it, it's a four byte integer. There's no such thing as a three byte integer, at least not in Fortran. So I, I need this byte there anyway. I might as well use it internally for alpha, even if I'm not doing anything with it yet. Uh, so we have red, green, blue, and then I want to have yellow, which is FFFF00, zero, zero, I think. And then white, uh, oh no, that's, all zeros is black, so this is going to be white. And I think that's okay. And then we're going to call write image. Except instead of with that file name, it's going to be like this. Uh, before I read this, I, I just want to see if this part works. It probably won't even compile. No, not that. Uh, why is that executable? Uh, I don't know if I did something weird to my WSL or if that was just like that by default. Uh, hmm. is, that, is that not how you remove executability? Uh, Let's 
says I can do a mode with minus. These should be optional. Invalid mode, minus x. I can do the numerical form. That should remove executability. <laughs> Just didn't do anything. Uh, that's six, right? Does this do anything? Oh, I was looking at the wrong one. No, that did something. Why did it only take away write privileges? Uh, oh well, I guess I'll just live with it. I'll have to be careful when I run a test. Okay, so that should have written something. Uh, there we have that. It's only 29 bytes. Uh, that makes I guess that makes sense for a 2 by 3 image, or a 3 by 2 image, whatever. Let's look at it. I have to zoom a lot. Yeah, that looks right. That looks right. So we've written the image, now I want to read the image, and then that's going to be the test. So uh, we'll have a second canvas, CV2, and then how do I want to handle end pass versus end fail? I had a boolean array in my Sintran interpreter project, but I think for this I'm really only testing one thing here, uh, so I'm not going to bother making an array, at least not for this one, not for this test. If all of the all of the red canvas pixels are equal to the written canvas pixels, then the test passed. Uh, so we'll do that. And then I want to print the number of tests at the end. Uh, be dried up a little bit, but it's just one line.
miracle that I remembered that. Let's see if that formats correctly. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's it. Uh, I also like to use double quotes instead of single quotes. I'm not going to bother with all those. Seriously, what is wrong with that? Do I have to call it? Isn't that exactly what I did? Line 55. What is wrong with this? Well, that's not the color that I wanted. Uh, foreground, there we go. And then I want this one to be red. What is wrong with those repeats? Stick to my lowercase convention. What is wrong with that? Is that not like exactly the same as this, but with a different string and a different number? No way. Just Okay, so that's why you don't name variables the same as intrinsic Fortran functions, because I have a variable named repeat, and then that prevents me from using the intrinsic repeat function, because now repeat refers to my variable instead of the intrinsic Fortran function. So I have to change the name of that. repeat or yeah that's fine I think that should do it there we go all right, now I have a separator, finally. And then can uncomment these other ones, which were totally fine. Uh, the issue is not with 
like the error message was this line of code, but the error the error wasn't the problem wasn't with this line of code. It was the fact that I had overridden the Fortran intrinsic repeat function. And the compiler doesn't care to warn me about that. It just lets me go ahead and then fucks me up later when I try to use the function without remembering that I had a variable with that name. All right, there we go. That's what I want it to look like. Now I have a separator before the tests start and another one at the end. Uh, and then I have some text, which is colored. Uh, we'll have to try breaking this to see if I get the other text. Uh, I also want some new lines in here. There and there. Uh, that'll probably work. There we go. Now I want to see if I can break this. So what happens if we don't even read the canvas? Uh, this might be a compiler error. Uh, I don't know if it'll be smart enough to know that this can't be allocated. Or it might crash. I, I don't really know what's going to happen. Okay, yeah, it crashed at line 34. Yeah, so you would think that it would return false if one of the arguments isn't allocated, uh, but instead it just crashes. So that's not really a great way to break the test. So let's set one of the pixels to zero. Uh, as long as I don't set the black pixel to zero, which is actually the black pixel would work because then alpha would be zero. Yeah, so that's a failure. Uh, the emoji doesn't work here. I think the emoji should work here. I probably can't run it. Yeah, but if I if I do the clean and rebuild, this might take a minute. But I I just want to see the emoji. And then I'll probably change it since it doesn't render correctly inside the WSL terminal anyway. Okay, that didn't take too long. Now it's test.exe. No, it doesn't work. Uh, maybe I pasted it in wrong or something. But let's just go back to the good old fashioned emoticon. I'll have to clean. Yep. Why is everything executable? All right, that'll work. Uh, I, th I think just to be safe, I want to commit this with a with an intentionally failing test just to see that it fails uh, because we, we did change this logic a lot around the return code. Uh, so just to be extra safe, I want to commit it like this. So again, that should fail. Yep, that failed. Uh, let's verify that it failed for the right reason. Yep, it, it compiled and ran the test. It didn't like crash or fail at some other point before it got to that. So that's good. Uh, now we can fix the test. Probably don't need to keep this tab open forever. Watch my last video if you want to see that what that letter B figure is about with on-curve and off-curve points. Alright, this is good. The test passed.
So that is a that is an extremely basic PPM test. It's a three by two pixel image. Uh, let's do like a bigger one. I don't want it to be huge because I don't want the testing to take a long time. Uh, but maybe like a hundred by two hundred pixels or something like that. Uh, and and let's do like a, a series of rectangles, sort of like we did. Uh, in the last stream or two. So we're just going to base it on the first test. So I'll copy and paste that. And then I want to call it. And then let's set up our rectangles. Uh, yeah, let's let's make it like 300 by 200. I guess that's big enough. Are even numbers okay? Do I want to test odd numbers? I don't think I care. I'll just stick with 300 by 200. Uh, but let's do different colors. I want all of these digits to be distinct. Uh, the FF always has to be FF because that doesn't get saved in the file. Uh, but then it's set to FF in the reader, and that's hard-coded. So the alpha has to be FF. If I change that, the test should break. Uh, so I don't want to change that. Let's do like a few different rectangles. want the, the rectangles to be not totally overlapping with each other. Uh, actually, I'll start that at 50. And then this last rectangle is going to be somewhere in the middle. Uh, 110 to 190. And then 70 to 130. Yeah, so these should all be non-overlapping. And then I want to change the colors. A in one of these colors. I, I want to test like every possible hex digit. Oh, no, I, I didn't do D anywhere. Then I have E. Okay. I feel like that's probably thorough enough. Uh, now let's run that. Should be two tests if it compiles. Suck routine. This is not a suck routine. I don't know how I typed that. Something failed.
That's interesting. Hmm. Let's look at the image in GIMP. That seems about right. Three different rectangles that overlap in different ways. Background. Oh, I don't think I initialized the background. Yeah, so let's initialize the image to some background. Uh, would that be a problem though? Because the test, like they should still be the same even if it's uninitialized. Oh, but the alpha, yeah, the alpha isn't necessarily FF. So I think that is it. I don't know what I typed in Vim there. Okay, that passed now. Uh, so the background should be different now. It should be sort of a gray instead of a totally dark black. There we go. We have two tests. Uh, not really sure what I'll do with the rest of the stream now, uh, because I don't know if I'm ready to test any actual typesetting results, because that API is not stable. It's not even close to stable. So I, I don't want to add tests for things before they're stabilized because then when I change the API, the tests break, not because like I actually broke functionality, but just because I added features. Uh, yeah, maybe I can start to look at the C map uh, because the next thing I want to do is I want to type set actual letters instead of having uh, glyph indices hard-coded. Uh, that's why I'm starting to work on Unicode, as you may have noticed, because I want to decode and encode Unicode code points to and or from UTF-8. Uh, and then I want to be able to look up those code points in the in the CMAP to get the glyph index. But first, let's see if this did two tests instead of just the one test that we did before. Uh, yeah, two tests, and then the output is mangled, like it has the time in the middle of the program's STDL, uh, so that's a little bit messed up, but looks good enough. Let's see Mac. Also looks good. Uh, yeah, all right, let's start to look at CMAPs. So, will this website work? Yeah, it's finally working again. So let's take a look at the computer modern font. Uh, maybe I'll do it for my scratch director because I have several other fonts in there. Uh, as far as I know, there are two different CMAP formats that are important. There's format four and format 12 if I remember those numbers correctly. So those are the most common ones and the most general ones. Uh, let's look at the CMAP data here. It says format four. Uh, so that everything is everything that I'm going to want is in the CMAP table, uh, but then it has different formats, uh, e e even though it's all within the TTF format. Uh, so four is, is it like UTF-16 or some sort of like two byte code point? Uh, and then format 12 is like a more general one. Uh, and then there are a bunch of other ones, some of which are totally obsolete and not recommended anymore. Uh, but this LaTeX computer modern font does use format four. So it's not the most up-to-date format 12, uh, but I want to, I want to parse this one. Uh, and then I've, I'm guessing Calibri might be like format 12, or yeah, I actually haven't really looked at any other font files. 
So do I have Calibri here? Yeah, uh, this might take a while. This might take a while because it's a larger font. Working. Come on, font drop. This is probably why the website stopped working, because I probably dropped in a font file that was too large. Let's start to look at the CMAP documentation. Uh, the Windows, the Microsoft documentation is probably for open type font, because that's a Microsoft format, as one of my viewers informed me. I wouldn't know myself, but then the Apple documentation, this is for TTF. Uh, so if you look at format, yeah. yeah. Fonts with a Unicode variation sequence subtable require a Unicode encoding subtable format four or 12. So I think four and 12 are the most important formats. Uh, and those will probably be the only two that I support unless Calibri is something else. If it is, maybe I'll just ignore Calibri because I, I don't want to I don't want to implement 12 different CMAP formats. That's ridiculous. I want to keep it some subset of possible TTF files. Yes, yeah, so like format 2 is for Japanese, Chinese and Korean. Uh, I I probably won't bother with that because if there are mistakes, I wouldn't be able to tell because I can't really recognize any of these letters. Uh, Korean isn't bad. Korean is just an alphabet. It's not. Uh, it's not logographs like Chinese or the kiragana or the, uh, the. The the other the other Japanese logographs. Okay, format four is for sixteen bit mappings, which is not super general because uh, UTF thirty two is, or UTF-8. Well, 16-bit mappings doesn't necessarily mean UTF-16, but yeah, Unicode code points could be up to four, four bytes or 32 bits. Yeah, many of the CMAP formats are obsolete or just never materialized to begin with. Oh, there are more than 12. There are 13 and 14. Uh, but yeah, there's there's a lot of documentation here. So I'm just going to focus on 4, and it's, it's still not rendering Calibri. Oh, there we go. So CMAT. Oh, this is also format 4. Maybe I'll only do 4, if unless I can find an example of a TTF file with format 12. I might not support 12. But yeah, this has this has a lot of glyphs. Uh, is it it's max p that tells us how many? This has like 7,000 glyphs, and it still uses format 4. Well, Calibri is a lot. Let me go back to Computer Modern. Actually, yeah, so if we look at max P for Computer Modern, it only has 700 characters. That's a lot fewer than Calibri. Uh, but then the CMAP is also format 4. Uh, but before we get to that, I think there's like a header of the CMAP table before you get to the format. Wait, there are three. How does that work? 
They're tables, like subtables of CMAT. Uh, why is this going to be Microsoft documentation? So there's a number of tables, and then there are also segments. So I really don't understand how that works. Uh, but then in essence, we have a mapping of, I don't know if this is mapping code points to glyph indices or glyph indices to code points. Uh, but in, in either case, it gives you that mapping. And that's the point of the CMAP table. A lot of data there. I don't know if this is, I guess it's decimal, not hex. Thirteen is two. Let's see if we can make sense of this. Thirteen is two. Is D thirteen? F is fifteen. Yeah, so D is thirteen. So Unicode code point 13 in decimal, that's D in hex, is index 2. So that's what the CMAP table tells us. It tells us Unicode code point 13 in decimal is glyph index 2. Uh, and then let's spot check one other one. Let's do it in the other order. Let's look at the glyph first. Uh, I, I don't want to do like these white space glyphs or whatever these are. Let's look at capital A. Uh, so Unicode 41, what is 41 in hex? Forty-one in hex is sixty-five in decimal. Uh, so sixty-five should be index thirty-six. So, so we should have 65 colon 36. 65, 36. Sixty-five, thirty-six. Yeah, so that that's what this data is telling us. Uh, but this isn't even the TTF file. This is font drops rendering of the TTF file. So the, the way that this is in the binary file, it uh, might be even more abstract. But first we have the version and the number of subtables, so we should be able to verify that. And these are UN16s. Version and num subtables. So if we look at the way that I read the max p table, uh, we can do something similar for cmap. Just have to make sure we don't do it in the middle of some other table. Uh, where do I want to do it? Do I want to do it before reading the glyphs or after? Doesn't really matter. I think maybe I'll get some information that will be useful before I read the glyphs. So I guess I'll do it right after max p. So cmap, I'm gonna seek to that. Uh, and then it's, I think it's the cmap version actually. cmap version and then the number of subtables. And 
just minimized OBS. I did not want to do that. So version and subtables. Version. And they're both U16, I think. Yep, they're both U and 16. And then we can print that, uh, but we have to declare them too. Cmap vers and ncmap. Just making everything integer eight because I'm lazy. Uh, the version is not a double is not a float or a fixed type, which is weird because most of the other versions are like that. This one's an integer. Cmap version. I think I want my line break before this because you have to be careful with that in Fortran. And then the number. That should print something. All right, so we have a version zero and three. I think that's correct from the what font drop was showing. Uh, zero and three. Right, and then, is it straight into the subtables? I'm, I'm sort of on my own now because earlier I was using Steve Hanov's blog, uh, but he doesn't really have anything about CMAPs in his blog. Uh, he has his GitHub linked, which I, I haven't looked at. Uh, maybe it'll be interesting to see if I can do this straight from the Apple documentation without referring to uh, somebody else's code. So I, I really don't know how to parse this. Uh, for everything else, I was following this blog to see how to parse it, but this this might be different. Uh, platform ID. Well, this, this is a subtable, and this does not show platform ID. So I'll kind of have no idea if I'm reading that correctly or not. Okay, it begins with a version followed by the number of tables and then the encoding subtables follow. So these should be immediately next. I'm going to have to wrap up this stream in about 10 minutes or so. It's Wednesday night. I don't have like infinite time.
really don't know why there are three different subtables. Do I need all three, or can I just do the first one and ignore the rest? Because yeah, it's saying that multiple subtables can point to the same data offset. So I, I don't even know if these three tables are going to be different. They might just all point to the same data. I guess I'll try the first one and see if that has useful data in it. And then if I get the data that I need from the first subtable, then I guess I can ignore the rest. Uh, I'll find out. Uh, I'm not going to find out tonight. I'm not going to be able to finish this. Uh, but the testing is done, so that was that was the goal for tonight. Well, it, it's not done, but we have we have two tests working, uh, and that's that's about as much of a stable API as I have that's testable right now. Okay, so we need platform ID, platform specific ID, and then an offset. There's UN 16, 16, and 32. I don't think I have a U32 reader yet. Oh, I do. Okay, never mind. and then 32. Oh, and this is so maybe I'll put this in a loop. Uh, and do I want to if so, I, I probably also want to encapsulate this into like a CMAP struct so I can just allocate the number of subtables for each struct and then I don't have to I don't have to have like parallel arrays for this within the TTF struct directly. Mm. Naming things is hard. The offset, I think this is just offset. I'll call it CMAP offset. So 16, 16, 32. I think that's correct. Platform ID. Platform SID. Uh, the ID, uh, I'll have no idea if it's right or not, or, or uh, I, I'm really not going to have any idea whether any of this is right or not. All right, I have to declare these things, uh, but then I'll just have to pray and jump to the offset and start start reading things and hope that it's correct. Uh, but w once I get to these these mappings, which I can verify here, like like we looked at. Uh, 65 Unicode code point 6 to 5 maps to glyph index 36. Once I get to those, that's data that I can verify by checking this. Uh, but until then, I'm I'm lost at sea and I have no idea if the stuff that I'm reading is correct or not. So it could get difficult to debug if this is wrong. Uh, platform, platform, and CMAP offset. something. Offset seems a bit low. That's, that's, oh, it might be a rel, I guess it's a relative offset. Do they say that? Offset of the mapping table. So 
ID range offset, which is apparently something different. Thirty-five occurrences of the word offset in this website. This is this is unmanageable. And most of them are not the whole word. So this offset, at least, is relative to the beginning of some sub 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 table or whatever. Since this thing is 28, that's a very low number. Uh, we can hex edit this file. What is the CMAP offset? This should be the CMAP offset 250. And like so, it can't be 28 because 28, if that was an absolute offset, it would be right in the middle of this, which is obviously the header of the file. It, it can't be a CMAP subtable. But if we go to 250, so this is. CMAP subtable. Two five zero. Because this is a checksum, this is the offset, and this is the length. And this is the next tag. So this has to be oh it's twenty five hundred. In, in hex. Should I just search for it rather than, yeah, I have to search for it. I forgot how long hex is. Okay, so this makes sense. So, so we have zero, version zero, uh, subtables three, another zero, another three, And then this is, this one is four bytes. Yeah, so this is 28 apparently, hex, one C in hex is 28, that sounds about right. Uh, so I think that's 28 relative to, to the start of the CMAP table, I guess. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28. That seems a bit weird because then what's what's this data in between here and here? Uh, oh, it's it's the other. It's the other subtables. So we have these things which should be in a loop from one to three. Uh, yeah, so then this, was this offset by 28? Or is that another subtable? Yeah, so, so I guess that makes sense as a relative offset from the CMAP table. Uh, I think I'm probably going to have to wrap up the stream right about now. There was another thing that did a relative offset. I'll search for offset plus. Yeah, so in reading glyphs, we have the glyph offset, but then that's relative to the offset of the glyph table itself. Uh, so I I believe the, the CMAP 
subtables are going to be similar to this, where it's a relative offset from the start of the CMAP table. I think I'm going to need to rename some things because I want to have CMAP offset just be the table itself, not the subtable. Uh, maybe I'll do that now. I'm going to wrap this line. And then I don't need this one. There you go. Oh, but it is inside the TTF struct. Yeah, it's inside the TTF struct. Uh, Sub offset now. We'll keep everything aligned. Don't jump. Don't jump, Kelly. Don't come up on the desk. I know you're thinking about it. She's about to jump. Yep, there she is. I, I know that look in her eye when she's thinking about jumping onto the desk. Hey, come on, <laughs> Kelly. I'm, all, I'm almost done. I'm sorry. You can't be up here right now. Good girl. Good girl, Kelly. Have I messed anything up here? Uh, hopefully it prints the same sub offset. So it should be 28. All right, that seems okay. Uh, do my tests still pass? Good, yeah, like I shouldn't have touched anything even related to the PPM testing. And that's the only thing I'm testing so far. So I think I can commit and end this. Typo, the typo lives. Uh, no, it's got to be just amend before am. There are two m's in. What the fuck? Is there one end in them? There we go. Okay. 
I'm not going to hang around and see if the tests pass because even Ubuntu takes a minute. Uh, so yeah, uh, I think that's it for today. This was a short stream. Uh, this weekend, hopefully I'll be able to uh, parse the rest of the CMAP data. Uh, and then what that should allow me to do is if I go back to main, uh, more than one main. Yeah, so what that should allow me to do is typeset letters instead of having these hard-coded glyph indices with like the letters in a comment off to the side. Uh, so that's the point of the CMAP table. Hopefully I'll get around to that this weekend. Uh, that's all for now, and uh, I'll catch you next time.